This week on the A Push Show, we're looking at Chapter 27, The Cold War. We'll look at the origins of the Cold War. I wonder how it started. Maybe it was a regular war that left the window open during the winter. We'll look at the collapse of peace. Sheesh, who built that peace? Some kind of crappy carpenter? We shall see. We'll look at American society and politics after the war. That is after the World War, not the Cold War. Gotta make sure that's clear. We'll look at the Korean War. Not to confuse wars here, but we are talking about a lot of wars. But the Korean War was just a subset of the Cold War, which is actually a hot war, which means it wasn't quite cold, but you get the picture, right? And then lastly, we'll look at the crusade against subversion. If it was anything like the children's crusade, it must have been very sad, tragic, and full of death. All this and more this week on The A-Push Show. chapter on the Cold War with a look at what happened between the United States and the Soviet Union. I mean, during World War II, they were friends. One minute you're high-fiving at the Elbe River, toasting to the end of Nazi fascism. Next thing you know, you're boycotting each other's Olympics and aiming nuclear weapons at each other. But thankfully, this chapter is called the Cold War, not the Nuclear Hot War, as the United States and the Soviet Union never engaged in a full-scale total war like World War II which is a very good thing. <laughs> I see what you did there, Taft. How the Cold War actually got started is open to a great degree of interpretation. Some have argued that America's aggressive imperialist agenda was to blame, and many have levied that same criticism at Russia. In reality, one could easily argue that both were kind of true. But remember that the United States had had a bad history with Russia, dating back to the Communist Revolution, when the United States refused to recognize the Soviet government, and there was the whole World War II thing where the United States took its sweet time invading Germany from the West while Russian soldiers and citizens were busy blocking Nazi bullets with their own bodies. On the surface, the tension between the Soviets and the Americans lied with conflicting visions of the post-war world. The United States wanted the world to abandon the old systems of military alliances and what they would call spheres of influence, which is basically a fancy way of saying imperialism. British leader Winston Churchill, President Roosevelt, and Russian leader Joseph Stalin agreed in the Atlantic Charter of 1941 to this post-war vision of no spheres of influence. But Russia really wanted spheres of influence in order to increase their nation's power, and the British had one of the most impressive spheres of influence ever to exist in the world. Needless to say, the United States' vision was not in tune with that of Britain and Russia, who wanted, in a way, to return to the old modes of imperialism that had existed before the onset of the First World War. And we would see these conflicts of interest emerge during wartime meetings between the United States, Britain, and Russia. During meetings in Casablanca, Morocco, and Turkey, on Iran, the Big Three, as they were called, would discuss issues like when the Western Front would open up to relieve Russia of fighting the brunt of the German army, or how soon Russia would help in fighting Japan, or who would get access to what oil fields that were recently discovered in the Middle East. You know, purely non-sphere of influence type stuff, just like the Atlantic Charter said. Right, Taft? Got a good mind to wash your mouth out with a bar of soap, mister. But one issue they never resolved was the dispute over Poland. Poland had been conquered by the Germans and Russia wanted to extend its territory into Polish territory once the war was over, and they wanted to install their own puppet communist regime. Britain and the United States wanted to keep Poland the way it was before the war and reinstall the old Polish government that had been living in exile in London during the war. In the end, they did the reasonable thing and decided to not decide and hope that things would just sort of settle themselves out, which they did not. 
A year later, the Big Three would again meet, but this time at the Russian resort town of Yalta, located on the coast of the Black Sea. In this series of meetings, agreements would be made regarding the Russian reacquisition of territory in Japan following Japan's surrender, but major decisions would be made regarding the establishment of the United Nations and the future of Germany, or so it seemed. At Yalta, agreements were made regarding the establishment of the United Nations, which would be a multinational organization with five permanent members members, each with veto power consisting of the United States, Great Britain, France, Russia, and China. The official charter would be ratified at a conference of 50 nations in April of 1945. And unlike the League of Nations, which died a slow political death, the United States Senate would immediately and overwhelmingly ratify the charter by a vote of 80 to 2. The disagreements over Germany and the fate of Eastern Europe would prove Yalta to be yet another meeting in which more issues remained unresolved than many had hoped. No agreement would be reached regarding Germany paying reparations as Stalin wanted heavy reparations and a permanent dismemberment of the nation. Basically, Russia wanted to break Germany in such a way that it would be permanently destroyed and never able to come back and invade Russia again. Cool out, Mr. Mutilation. But Roosevelt wanted a reconstructed and reunited Germany. In the end, reparations would be kicked down the road for a future commission, and the United States, France, and Great Britain, and Russia would each control a zone of occupation in the country and in Berlin with a very soft plan on figuring out how to reunify the country in the future. In Poland and the rest of Eastern Europe, Roosevelt would watch with frustration as Stalin would install one puppet regime after another as the Soviet Soviet Union continued to expand its influence and control over the region. However, Roosevelt did not abandon hope in settling differences between the Soviet Union and the United States, but that hope died with him when he suddenly passed away of a stroke on April 12, 1945. And with the death of FDR, we see the hope of lasting peace between the Soviet Union and the United States die out as well, as the Truman administration would see Stalin's Soviet empire as nothing more than a loathsome empire led by a loathsome man. Loathsome, Taft! <coughs> One of Truman's first policies as president was to, as he put it, get tough with Russia. Truman believed he would be able to get 85% of what he wanted with Russia. He would actually get far less. In a meeting at Potsdam in the Russian-occupied part of Germany, Truman met with Russian and British leaders where Truman would accept recognition of the communist government of Poland. He would also accept Stalin's proposed Russian-slash-Polish border, but he would refuse to permit the Russians to claim any reparations from the British, French, and American side of Germany. Out of this, a new split of Germany would occur as the western portion of the country would emerge as one nation and the eastern portion under the control of Russia would emerge as another. In Asia, many Americans had visions of a strong influence in this region after the war thanks to a strong partnership with a free and democratic China. But that would prove to be a disaster as the so-called democratic government of Chiang Kai-shek was not only corrupt and incompetent, it was also not really in charge as the ongoing civil war between Shek's nationalists and Mao Zedong's communists proved to be increasingly in favor of the communists. The United States continued to pump money and and ammunition to the nationalists and even considered joining the war, but ultimately did not as they watched helplessly as the communists eventually overran and took control of China. To counter the growth of communism in China, the United States sought to increase the power of Japan, their former enemy in World War II. The United States would remove restrictions on Japanese industry as the nation would be rapidly developed to become a pro-Western alternative to China. Much like in Europe, Asia was proving to be less of a free and open region, but a region marred by sharp divisions between Soviet communists and American capitalist forces. With the hope of a free and tacitly American and British-controlled world vanishing in the wake of World War II, American diplomat George F. Kennan would call for a pivot in foreign policy. He would propose a new approach that would become known as the Truman Doctrine, which was basically the approach of containing Soviet influence throughout the world. 
At the time it was introduced, Soviet forces were looking to take control of governments in Turkey and Greece, and thanks to $400 million of American support to pro-Western governments in both of those countries, communist forces were unable to take control. A key aspect of the containment policy of the Truman Doctrine was the Marshall Plan. The United States recognized Western Europe was in shambles after World War II and badly needed assistance not only because the war was so brutal, but also because if assistance wasn't given, Western Europe could easily fall under the control of the Soviet Union. Secretary of State George Marshall would propose his Marshall Plan, which sought to give aid to Western Europe. After Czechoslovakia would see its government taken over by communists, Americans in Congress would rapidly accept this plan, and the Economic Cooperation Administration would be established to oversee the Marshall Plan in 1948. By 1950, nearly $12 billion would be invested into Western Europe, helping to increase industrial production by 64%, thus stabilizing the region, providing needed post-war prosperity and growth, and most importantly to the United States, ensuring long-lasting alliances and economic partnerships in Europe. As the United States increased its influence abroad, it also mobilized itself for war. When or where that war might occur was undetermined, but the United States would seek to ready itself anyway. Truman would push Congress to approve a military draft and selective service system in 1947 and 1948 to ensure the United States would always have a sizable military always at the ready. He would also push to pass the National Security Act of 1947, which helped to establish the Department of Defense, which would oversee the entire United States military as well as the Central Intelligence Agency to collect information both openly and covertly as the Cold War continued. In the name of national security, the CIA would also meddle in the political and military affairs of many foreign countries as the powers of the president would increase dramatically. During this time, the United States agreed that the best course of action to ensure containment of Russian expansion in Europe would be to consolidate the three western zones of partitioned Germany into one democratic nation. Britain and France would agree, and the West German Republic was born in June of 1948. The only problem with this was that part of West Germany also included the western part of the German capital of Berlin, which was entirely in East Germany. You're right, Taft. It is confusing. And in response to the consolidation of Western powers in Germany, Soviet leader Joseph Stalin would issue a blockade of the Western part of Berlin. Essentially, he blocked all food, fuel, and supplies from entering that part of the city unless they or the West accepted Soviet control. Rather than engage in military confrontation, the United States instead initiated a 10-month airlift in which American planes would drop food, fuel, and needed supplies keeping the people of West Berlin alive. Eventually, Stalin gave up the blockade and the division of Germany into two nations, East Germany and West Germany, was official. Out of the Berlin airlift crisis, we also see the acceleration of the creation of an alliance system of Western Europe as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, would be agreed upon in April of 1949. The 12 initial countries would agree on the somewhat standard alliance agreement that any attack on one member country was an attack on all. The Soviet Union and their Eastern European allies would make a similar alliance organization with the Warsaw Pact. However, by 1949, the Cold War was heating up considerably and seemed a bit less cold than before. For starters, the Soviets had successfully developed their own atomic bomb, which meant that the United States were no longer the only nuclear kids on the block anymore. Also, the pro-Western nationalists of China had lost control of the mainland and had to flee to the small island of Taiwan off of China's southern coast. The U.S. government refused to recognize the communist government of China, and many Americans believe the new government under Chairman Mao Zedong to be yet another puppet regime of the Soviet Union. Out of all this, the United States would create its National Security Council in 1950. Commonly referred to as NSC-68, this document would outline the official U.S. foreign policy as it pertained to the spread of communism. The United States would announce that it would no longer rely on other countries to resist communism themselves and would instead involve itself more directly in the prevention of the spread of communism, regardless of the perceived value of the country in question. Also, the federal budget for defense would increase 
fourfold. This new containment policy had many opponents. Many on the left felt the policy to be far too belligerent and that it may lead to unnecessary spending and violence. However, the policy found a greater amount of critics from the right as conservatives opposed containment as not being confrontational enough. Men like those who belong to the John Birch Society believe the American government was infiltrated by secret communist forces and that containment policies were proof of their influence. Though this group was seen largely as an extremist group, many Americans shared their belief that communism was the greatest threat to American society. You also had people like future Secretary of State for the Eisenhower administration, John Foster Dulles, who believed the containment policies had failed nations that fell to Soviet influence. Dulles believed that the United States should not just contain Soviet expansion, but should roll back areas of influence gained by the Soviets. Though the United States never adopted this policy, it certainly didn't much veer away from the policy of containment as long as the Soviet Union existed. And throughout our study of U.S. history, we see that we are a nation of duality. And our biggest duality is probably the idea that we are a free and independent nation, yet we deny freedom and independence to so many people in the United States, in particular people of color as well as women. And here in this chapter we'll see another duality in that despite the United States' great potential for economic prosperity, it struggled initially with that economic prosperity, which would eventually lead to political turmoil. The abrupt finish to World War II with the dropping of the super-secretly developed nuclear bombs had very successful results in ending the war, but had mixed results in a moral sense because dropping nuclear weapons on civilians is never a good look, and also had mixed results in the economic sense, as many people were somewhat depending on a long-lasting government contract to keep on paying out. With the war's end and war provisions no longer necessary, the contracts and people who worked for said contracts were no longer necessary as well. But despite the abrupt end to the war, the United States did not struggle with reconversion as much as some had thought. Reconversion is a word that means going back to the way things were, and the post-war economy did quite well despite many people's fear that the economy may slip back into the depression of the 1930s. Many people had a good amount of money saved up thanks to wartime jobs, and now with the war over, consumer goods were now more widely available for purchase. In addition to the increased ability to spend, the United States government government continued in its role as a national provider of economic stability with the implementation of the GI Bill. Also known as the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, the GI Bill gave veterans of World War II cheap mortgages to buy a house or loans to open a small business or a free college education. Now, of course, as this was still the United States in the 1940s, the GI Bill, much like the New Deal, also worked to solidify economic racism as mortgages and loans would often be denied to African Americans unless they chose to live or open a business in underdeveloped and federally designated areas for black Americans, and many universities still refused to admit black students regardless of their service for their country. But the GI Bill did succeed in pumping additional money into the national economy. However, with a great deal of additional money circulating in the economy, as is often the case with inflation causing the price of everything to go up quickly, people's wages and salaries usually struggle to keep up as well. As a result, the labor movement, which had been increasingly active and confrontational throughout the late 1930s and throughout the war, would continue its use of strikes and labor stoppages to advocate for the well-being of workers and their families. Major strikes within the mining and railroad industry would rehash some of the same types of battles between workers, management, and the government, except unlike the 1910s and 1920s, unions were able to win some of these battles and the government was less likely to brutally step in on the side of business leaders. But as the war ended, we see that many of Truman's attempts to continue certain New Deal-esque policies met increasing resistance from conservatives in Congress. The New Deal was waning by the late 1930s, and many of the provisions of the old FDR policies were effectively eliminated by the end of World War II. Truman attempted to continue some of those policies with his Fair Deal proposal. 
The proposal sought to do things like expand Social Security benefits, more federal action to ensure employment and housing, more permanent laws regarding fair employment practices, long-range environmental and public works projects, and government-sponsored research and development. But conservatives were winning more and more seats in Congress as many Americans grew suspicious, frustrated with increased government spending and the increasing role of government in people's lives. Republicans were able to win back the House and the Senate, which doomed many of the proposals that were part of Truman's fair deal. The most notable action of the new Republican Congress was the passage of the Taft-Hartley Act. Taft-Hartley was named for leading Republican Senator Robert Taft, who was actually the son of former presidents and Supreme Court Justice and cat namesake, William Howard Taft. Despite Taft the Cat's pro-labor stance, Taft-Hartley was terrible for labor as it made closed shop businesses illegal. A closed shop is a business that won't hire anyone outside of the union. Though many workplaces still force new employees to join a union or bargaining unit once hired, the new law allowed states to pass right-to-work laws, which prohibited a workplace from forcing workers to join a union upon getting hired. Though this would not destroy the labor movement as many had feared, it did damage weaker unions that were made up of people with little to no experience being a union member. And in the presidential election of 1948, we start to see cracks begin to appear in the previously unstoppable Democratic coalition. As Truman continued to fail to pass many of his New Deal-esque fair deal proposals through the conservative Congress, two large Democratic coalitions would defect from the party. More leftist progressives were frustrated with the Truman administration's inability to pass legislation and willingness to compromise on issues they felt should not be compromised. As a result, they would leave the party and form a new progressive party. But the larger defection occurred among conservative Southern Democrats who were outraged by proposed legislation that would ensure civil rights for African Americans. Southern Democrats, also known as Dixiecrats, would defect and form the state's rights party. And as you may remember from the Civil War, when the South refers to states' rights, it almost always means a state's right to allow white people to oppress and exploit black people. But despite these defections and almost everyone thinking that he was going to get absolutely whooped, Truman won anyway in 1948. He ran against Republican candidate Thomas Dewey, the dignified, competent, and capable governor of New York. But Truman ran a vigorous campaign in which he traveled 32,000 miles, delivering 356 speeches and appealed to many workers and minorities. His strategy worked as he was able to win 303 electoral votes and 49.5% of the popular vote, compared to Dewey's 189 electoral votes and 45.1% of the popular vote. But despite his victory, Truman continued to be denied by the conservative Republican Congress. Now, Truman did achieve some victories with raising the minimum wage, expanding Social Security, and ensuring some low-income housing measures, though this policy was also severely underfunded in its execution and also very racist, as it essentially worked to ensure long-term housing segregation. But Truman could not pass laws regarding national health insurance or civil rights, but he was able to desegregate the military and the Supreme Court did decide that the federal government could not be used to enforce private agreements or covenants among white homeowners to keep African Americans out of white neighborhoods. It's also worth noting that though the government ruled that it would enforce these covenants, it did not do anything regarding making these covenants illegal. But looming like a giant cloud over all of the political and economic events of the time was the specter of the nuclear age. The amazing power of nuclear weapons excited and terrified people the world over as some naturally feared the worst as the potential for the world to be completely destroyed seemed more real than ever, especially with the United States and the Soviet Union both having nuclear weapons and both hating the other. Film and television of the time often featured stories regarding disastrous futures because of nuclear war and also featured characters who expressed feelings of isolation and fear in this scary new world. <laughs> 
But many were excited by the potential of this new technology as the prosperity of the age as well as the recent victory in World War II made many Americans believe that though nuclear technology did make for truly terrifying and powerful weapons, it could also provide key assets like cheap electricity. As a result, nuclear power plants sprang up all over the country as most Americans celebrated the progress these facilities represented with little thought to the danger they could present. But of course one can't get too happy about nuclear technology, especially when nuclear technology is so closely associated with weapons of mass destruction, especially the weapon of mass destruction, which could spell the end of humanity as we know it. And the potential for nuclear destruction seemed frighteningly high as the communist worlds of the Soviet Union and China were in conflict with the worlds of the capitalist United States over a conflict in the peninsula of Korea. Much like Eastern Europe, there was a great deal of disagreement between the United States and communist nations of China and Russia regarding the future of Korea, which had been occupied by the Japanese throughout much of the 1930s and the early 1940s. The Soviets supported the communist regime of North Korea by heavily arming it, whereas the United States supported the pro-Western government of Syngman Rhee, who had a small army that he primarily used to suppress opposition within his own side. South Korean government. The North saw the weakness of the South as an opportunity to reunify the country and would invade their southern neighbor. The United States would then act upon their foreign policy of containment outlined in NSC-68. They would invade Korea and seek to push out the Communist Army of the North, not simply as an act of containment, but an act of liberation to provide a free, independent, democratic, and unified Korea. Using provisions within agreements in the United Nations, a predominantly American-led invasion of Korea began in the summer of 1950. The vastly superior American army pushed Korean communist troops further and further north, and American troops were able to conquer the North Korean capital of Pyongyang. However, this speedy invasion would turn into a stalemate once China got involved, something Truman had hoped to avoid. Truman's general, Douglas MacArthur, advocated that the United States bomb key Chinese regions, invade China, and perhaps even use atomic weapons on China. Truman refused to give MacArthur permission to wage this type of war, but rather than simply follow Truman's demands, MacArthur would express his own outrage towards the president in a public letter. Truman would fire MacArthur for his insubordination in 1951, but the majority of Americans supported MacArthur and his return to the United States from Korea was met with wild enthusiasm. Truman's popularity waned for a bit as the stalemate in Korea continued as peace talks and the war itself would stretch from 1951 to 1953. The Korean War did not see nearly the degree of mobilization that the nation saw in World War II. However, wartime production during the Korean War did help avert a recession thanks to government spending. There was also an attempt to broker the same sort of no-strike policy regarding labor with Truman's attempt at wartime economic regulation. However, organized labor would achieve two key victories with a successful nationwide steel strike in 1952 and a key Supreme Court decision that declared the president overstepped his powers when he tried to use the government to seize steel mills during the strike. In total, 140,000 American soldiers would lose their lives fighting to keep communism out of Korea, which left a lot of Americans angry and bitter. Out of this bitterness and anger came suspicion that something within the United States itself was wrong and must be rooted out. Which brings us to our last section of the chapter, the crusade against subversion. Just as World War I saw a red scare after its close, World War II would see a much larger red scare as the United States worried about communist influences within its own country as the Soviet Union presented a real communist blockage of American dominance throughout the world. We'll take a look at how anti-communist hysteria emerged in the 1950s as the mostly overblown fear of communist infiltration in the federal government would cause the ruins of thousands of careers and would cause the end of 20 plus years of political dominance by the Democratic Party. Taft, are you a communist? That's, um, that's not how communism works, Taft.
Like a lot of analyses of various cause and effect relationships throughout history, the Red Scare of the 1950s has numerous causes, with no single cause clearly taking precedence over others. But the Red Scare did have a few main causes. One, people were frustrated with the massive casualties and overall lack of success in Korea. Americans fresh off the victory of World War II expected Korea to be a pushover and were baffled as to why victory wasn't swift and decisive. Two, Americans were also astounded as to how the Soviet Union developed nuclear weapons so quickly and immediately assumed disloyal Americans leaked secrets to the Russians. Three, people just are kind of attracted to conspiracy theories because a lot of people are morbidly curious and like to fancy themselves more informed and intelligent than everyone else. And four, the Republican Party correctly recognized that they could exploit for their own political success the American fears and suspicions regarding subversive communist influences within American government. The Republican-controlled Congress put together a committee called the House of Un-American Controlled Activities Committee, or the HUAC, to investigate suspected communist influences within the Democratic-controlled facets of the federal government. Again, this was an effort not so much to actually root out communists, but more to weaken Democrats in order for the Republicans to gain control of government. The HUAC would first go after Hollywood writers, actors, and directors who had real or suspected communist leaders meetings in their past. The so-called Hollywood 10 refused to testify to the HUAC as many were jailed or blacklisted from Hollywood, which means that everyone else essentially agreed to never hire them ever again. However, the HUAC was able to produce a rather significant degree of alarm within the American public when it was able to prove that a former high-ranking member of the State Department, Alger Hiss, was in fact engaged in acts of espionage with the Soviet Union. During his testimony, Hiss was caught in a lie regarding sharing official State Department documents with Soviet spies. He would be convicted of lying under oath, also known as perjury, and sentenced to several years in prison. As a result of his guilt, American hysteria regarding Soviet infiltration was in full swing. And the truth was, a lot of the accused either sympathized with communist organizations or were active members of communist organizations within the previous three to four decades. Socialism and communism had a great deal of support from various parts of the country at the time, especially when so many elements of capitalism had failed to meet the basic needs of so many people. However, to connect these people's past dealings with communist organizations with the conspiracy to subvert the United States through shadowy dealings with the Soviet Union was often very difficult to prove, but certainly not impossible. It was also entirely possible during these times that the simple accusation was indicative enough of a sentence of guilt within the court of public opinion. Out of the initial success of the HUAC, the Truman administration sensed that it had to acquiesce to the HUAC and anti-communist sentiments throughout the country. They would attempt to root out suspected Soviet subversion within government by instituting a policy of loyalty review in order to see who could potentially be seen as threats to American government. As a result of these loyalty reviews, over 2,000 employees were forced to resign with another 212 dismissed because they were deemed to be a security risk. Some of the people would lose their jobs because of attendance at socialist or communist meetings earlier in life, having acquaintances or family members who are communists, or consuming or possessing literature deemed to be communist in nature. The director of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, would harass numerous Americans suspected of espionage, and despite a presidential veto from Truman, Congress would pass the McCarran Internal Security Act, which required all communist organizations to register with the government. A great deal of the anti-communist hysteria came from the fears rooted in the fears of sharing nuclear secrets with the Russians. The successful conviction of Klaus Fuchs as well as Ethel and Julius Rosenberg of secretly funneling secrets from the Manhattan Project to Russian operatives seemed to confirm to many Americans that not only were there subversive forces working within the government, but that these forces had to be rooted out immediately. And it was this hysterical fear that made the rise of such an absurd figure like Joseph McCarthy a somewhat comical yet terrible and real period in American history. 
Joe McCarthy was a rather unremarkable first-term senator from Wisconsin who soon gained national attention when he boldly claimed at a speech in West Virginia that he had a list of 205 known communists that were currently working in the federal government. Fun fact, McCarthy actually had no such list as his actual evidence didn't really exist, but with communist hysteria as strong as it was, a political witch hunt ensued that would have made the folks of 17th century Salem, Massachusetts proud. McCarthy and the other members of special subcommittees would call forward hundreds of suspected communists, publicly badger and humiliate these individuals, and ruin many lives and careers in the process. Despite these often absurd show trials, almost no one in government dared to speak out against McCarthy out of fear of being labeled a communist as well. Not even General Dwight Eisenhower dared to speak out against McCarthy, even though McCarthy went after Eisenhower's comrade in arms during World War II and General George MacArthur. Well, of course not, Taft. You fear nothing except the vacuum cleaner. McCarthy represented was a lot of resentments rolled into one. There was a huge fear and resentment of communist influence, sure, but there was also a great deal of resentment from Republicans towards Democrats, as well as members of their own party who refused to always toe the party line. There was also resentment for what was known as the Eastern Establishment, and Joe McCarthy was more than happy to go after people who represented these sources of resentment. With frustration over the lack of decisive victory in Korea, growing fears of Soviet influence abroad, and growing fears of communist subversion in government, Americans had had about enough of Harry Truman and demanded a change. Truman wisely chose not to run for re-election in 1952, and the Democrats instead chose the charming and intelligent governor from Illinois, Adlai Stevenson. To run against Stevenson, the Republicans chose a nearly perfect candidate for the time in Dwight Eisenhower. One of the military heroes of World War II, Eisenhower seemed the perfect leader for a country frustrated with a lack of victory in Korea and the perceived failure to assert American dominance against the Soviet Union, both inside and outside the United States. To bring the conservative Republican revival full circle, Eisenhower would choose as his running mate the young California Senator Richard Milhouse Nixon, who had made quite the name for himself championing some of the same repressive attitudes towards perceived communists as Joe McCarthy. With Eisenhower's status as a strong war hero and Nixon's willingness to root out subversion even if it didn't quite exist, the Republicans won the 1952 election, easily winning 55% of the popular vote and 442 electoral votes to Stevenson's 86. Eisenhower's victory marked the end of 20 years of Democratic dominance and marked the end of the worst of the post-war turbulence. The prosperous yet rather repressive era of the 1950s was underway. Next week, we'll look at the culture of affluence within the 1950s as the mainstream American culture of conformity tried to suppress certain influences of nonconformist culture with very mixed results. On behalf of myself and William Howard Taft, thank you guys so much for watching. And don't forget, we got to keep pushing, G.
did it, Taft. After the break, we did it.